Nico. Good uh, evening, everybody. Uh, delighted uh, to have you join us here this evening for the webinar focused around the care of the child derived from um, the policy lab, which was uh, and is a child of uh, Deputy Richard Bruton's. Um, delighted uh, to play MC tonight. My name is Maria Walsh. I'm a member of the European Parliament representing Fine Gael, uh, across the Midlands Northwest constituency and here in the Parliament. Uh, virtually connecting live, um, I sit within the EPP group. Um, we have a number of amazing speakers, insights and findings from uh, various policy kitchens, uh, which one of my colleagues will walk through the process in just a few minutes. Uh, but I wanted to acknowledge all the colleagues because we have a number of representatives, particularly our councillors dotted right throughout the country um, and uh, uh, deputy senators uh, representing us in Leinster House. Um, but I especially want to welcome those who per perhaps are not uh, party uh, affiliated or linked, um, but are really passionate about how we develop policy in our country uh, through the lens of Fine Gael, uh, and our members. Um, and it's really important to welcome you to say um, it's great to have you uh, share your ideas, thoughts, uh, and input so we can find better solutions and better care of the child networks um, and, and, sect and support our sector. Um, I just want to acknowledge all those, as I said, who are here. A couple of housekeeping rules. We are live on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, and I'm going to stress that from the start. Um, so if you do not want to be seen on screen, just in case, um, I ask you to close, uh, turn off your camera. Um, we are, of course, a digitally active and engaging party, um, and we will be checking out hashtag policy lab. And if you tag at Finnegale, if you're using any of the social media platforms or after this, if you want to share really good ideas and solutions too, and um, please, please connect either with a councillor or parliamentary party uh, team member or use social media. We'd love to hear from you. Um, before I hand it over to um, our policy lab uh, expert, Mr. Richard Bruton, I just want to give a quick overview of what's ahead. So we'll hear from uh, Deputy Bruton. Uh, we'll also hear from Deirdre Duffy, who will present the survey findings and highlights from the various policy kitchens. Um, and that will go on for about uh, 10 minutes and she'll walk us through uh, her findings through um, slides. Then we'll hear from uh, Councillor Daniel Butler as he will outline the role of policy kitchens and the processes that have been in place um, uh, through the care of the child policy. Um, and then we will hear from uh, one part of the, the webinar I'm very excited about, we'll hear from reflections on the policy kitchen experience. And we'll hear from one of our facilitators, uh, Nikki Morley, uh, not only a facilitator for, uh, and a mum, and very uh, focused on the sector as a whole. Um, and we'll hear from a number of attendees also. So we hear from Lauren, Denise, Kieran, and Karen, uh, and they represent just experiences and highlight the challenges from their perspective and what they share in the policy lab uh, and or I should say kitchen experience. I'll pass it back over to, to Richard uh, who will talk about next steps and then we will open the floor to Q&A which we also have leading experts to share their insights um, and their vision uh, and what they've learned and what they'd love for us to build into our policy and legislation. So we'll hear from Professor Noreen Hayes, we'll also hear from Regina Bouchel um, and we will hear if time allows, from other uh, policy lab experts and leaders in their own field, Senator Mary Sear Kearney, Denise Cronin, and Marion uh, Coy. Um, and then we'll wrap up and aim to do that by 9.15. So without further ado, you won't hear from me for too much longer. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Richard Bruton, uh, deputy. Um, he's the chairperson of our Fine Gael Parliamentary Party, former minister for jobs, enterprise and innovation, minister for education and skills, Minister for Communications, Climate Action and the Environment. And he established the Fine Gael Policy Lab as an innovative way to develop policy. Um, his aim has always been from the forefront of this to allow a much wide range uh, of people to input into policy formation. So those who know the problems firsthand are heard and are impacting our policy going forward. So Richard, I'll pass to you. 
Yeah, well, thanks very much, Maria. I think you summed it up in the nutshell there. Um, I suppose coming out of COVID, we're all reassessing our priorities. Um, and one of the things we've learned is the importance of uh, care for the children in, in this difficult time. Uh, and we're trying to look at policy in a different way. I think that's really what's behind the policy lab. I think as Maria has said, too often the people who have the greatest influence on policy are not the people who either have to implement it or the people who live with the consequences. Uh, and what we want to do is reverse that and make sure that it's the lived experiences of people who are dealing with the consequences and who are having to work at the cold face, that that sort of lived experience influences the policy. Uh, so that's what this has been all about. The policy lab seeks to, I suppose, reverse the order of policy development and start with those challenges expressed in open, uh, uncensored, if you like, uh, kitchens, as we call them. So it's a facilitated engagement where no holes are barred, where the real challenges go down on the table and where suggestions for solutions uh, come forward. Now, we are conscious, of course, that you know, not every idea is a perfect idea. So what we do following those sort of kitchens is we're going to sit down and try to thrash out the how of making the suggestions that have come out of uh, ordinary people's experience, how we make those uh, suggestions real and implementable. So to help us in that, we'll be forming task forces that will involve some of the people who actually engage in the kitchens, some people who have expertise. And as Maria said, we've also formed an recording in progress. People who have experience either in the, uh, in the actual implementation of the child care policy, or people who've studied it uh, as a professional academic, or people who understand it and, and promote it in many different ways. So we've formed a, a really good panel of people who will help guide this process to kick the tires, if you like, on ideas that filter up through, through the, through the, 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 the uh, various engagements we have. The other thing that makes this different is that the whole process is overseen by a board that is not dominated by politicians. The majority of those on the board are people who've been chosen for their ability to see things outside of the box, if you like. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have Marion Coy chair it, but a range of expertise has helped there. So it guarantees that when ideas come up and if they're published by the board, they will be reaching a high standard. We believe that this is a, a new way of doing policy, a better way of doing policy, much more open, much more reflective of the sort of modern expectations that people have of policy making. And it, 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 I suppose it, it takes uh, some lessons from the Citizens' Assembly, which have been so successful in helping us address difficult issues. Uh, this is uh, another area where we believe we can make a much better outcome for everyone involved if we shape it uh, by the input of, of people like yourselves who, who are on this uh, call tonight. So that in, in a nutshell is how the, how the, the idea came to, 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 to be. Uh, and far from what Maria says, I'm not an expert. I'm learning myself how we can make this work. Uh, but it has been extremely exciting. Uh, the sort of engagement we've had, the input of ideas that we've had is really has invigorated all of us who've been involved. So, we're looking forward uh, to this evening, but also the work that is really just starting after, after this to, to uh, winnow out the best ideas and put them into action. So I'll leave it at that, Maria. Uh, thank you, Richard. I appreciate that. Um, keeping moving through our, our schedule, um, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Deirdre Duffy, who will present to us the survey findings and highlights. And just to give you an introduction into who Deirdre is, uh, she's a member of our policy lab. Um, she is a former deputy director for the of the Irish Council for Civil Liberties and the campaign manager for Together for Yes. So um, very instrumental in shaping and supporting the care of the child policy. So pass it to you, Deirdre. Thanks very much, Maria. I'm absolutely blessed this evening. Some of you will have, will have heard me say this before with beautiful sunshine coming through my window here. So I'm fiddling around with blinds, uh, trying to block it out, which is probably not the best thing. But I'm going to share with you some um, uh, PowerPoint now of some results from the survey. And um, I, I won't bore you to death now with, with detail and numbers, but I do think when you see 
the actual numbers and the issues and the graphs, it really brings home uh, what's been important to people. Um, but maybe to kick it off, just to let you know that the survey was disseminated very widely um, to members of Fine Gael and also people um, not within the Fine Gael membership. Um, and we had 2,372 responses. And I think just picking up there from what Richard was saying about how COVID has changed all our lives, um, you can certainly see that coming through in the survey responses around things like responsiveness and flexibility and availability and how our lives are changing and being shaped. Um, but I wanted to share with you as well at the beginning that uh, most of the people who responded were either parents or people who provided care. And we'll go through those, um, the, the various categories in the slides. And also so that you know, there was what's going to come out here now and what I'm going to share with you in the survey um, is equally applicable to the rural and the urban um, respondees. So we're not seeing some chasm down the middle between rural Ireland and, and urban Ireland. Uh, thirdly, I just want to let you know that, um, sorry there, my battery is a bit low. Yeah, there you go, more housework, more, more housekeeping, is that the predominant feature that came up from the survey was around the well-being of the child. So when people were asked, why is care of the child important? The number one thing was the well-being of the child. And I think we can all recognize that in our society. Um, three more things maybe, um, and we'll go through this in a little bit more detail, but availability and affordability were some of the key issues um, that were coming across in the survey. But then interestingly, what's very important to, um, to what was very important to the parents and the people who inputted was, so when, when they were asked, okay, what's the most important thing in terms of childcare? It was the standard of it and the fact that it provided an equality of opportunity. So again, the link between well-being and equality of opportunity and this standard of care that as a society we want for our younger people. And then maybe just two more in terms of an overview. Um, the top two issues that were really important was the quality and the standard and the location. So in our survey, location trumped. Uh, affordability, which is which is interesting, and we'll, we'll see some more information. And then lastly, um, because, as Richard said, we were looking at this issue in a holistic manner, um, providers of care featured very strongly as well, and certainly things like career progression um, and wages and being able to forge a really uh, supportive and, and um, good career in this sector was key. So if you just bear with me one second there, feel free to put any questions into the chat box while I'm, while I'm getting the presentation up. Okay, sorry. Deirdre, just as you are setting that up, I wanted to flag, uh, picking up from your, your point there, if anybody does have questions or wants to share something, please use the Q&A function and also hashtag policy lab at Fine Gael, And we, we're going to keep an eye on uh, our social media platforms too, if anybody has anything to share there too. Thanks. Okay, it's, it's not going into present mode for me, but I think that's probably okay if anyone uh, has any magic can throw them into the chat function for me, but we'll drive on. So this is the result of our surveys, as, uh, as I said earlier. Um, okay, so we've gone through the amount uh, just over 2,372. Um, I'm going to flick through some of these slides. There's quite a bit of information on them, but I think you'll, you'll find them useful. And if, uh, as I said, if anyone wants to ask a direct question on the data, they can put it into the chat box or they can contact us afterwards. So. Right, so first off there, the importance of each of the following in early childhood supports. And you'll see there, for example, at 74% is coming out the development of the child's capabilities, but at 89% at the bottom there is the well-being and the self-esteem of the child. Um, following statements, we asked people to rank them. So, and this is in relation to, for example, if, as Richard said, if we're developing policy, new initiatives, on the basis of this policy lab, um, which is the end goal in itself, what's the most appropriate role for the state? And we gave a few options there. 
And you'll see that 46% right there in the middle, ensuring availability and affordability came out tops. So here we go in terms of satisfaction with the following aspects of childcare. And I just want to um, stand there. So you'll see there very clearly, people are satisfied with the quality of childcare. It's coming up at 75%. But they're quite, um, I suppose it's fair to say, satisfied with the affordability rate, which is coming up at 19%. The next thing I'm going to go to is the steps that would strengthen the capacity of the sector to deliver better ways of supporting children in early years. And we ask people to rank them. You see there again in terms of financial supports, 64% felt that was the most important. Better career paths for childcare workers, 55%, and expanding the state provision in the sector, so more involvement by the state within the childcare sector at 42%. I'm just going to pause in between the sides so that people have a chance to digest as well. Moving on here. Um, just to give a bit of a summary of the views from parents, guardians, and users of childcare services. So one of the things that Richard would have mentioned in his intro is that we wanted to be as inclusive and to gather as, as, as much opinions as possible in terms of childcare. We were very keen that we wouldn't just be asking parents their views, but everyone in the community and society who, who looks after children or has a caring role for children. And here we go, linked to the well-being, but how important is access to an early childhood service? 70%, extremely important. And if you couple that with uh, very important at 19, we're, we're looking to a really, really high level of importance for people. In your view, how well are children with additional needs catered for in early years? And this is something that's been in the public consciousness quite a lot recently in terms of summer provision and other supports. So I thought it was important to mention it here as well. And there's quite a, a difference there in terms of the yellow slide there, just so that people can see at 39%, that's maybe not so well people believe it's being done at the moment. Okay, moving on to availability. So when we ask people to think about childcare facilities that are near to them, we asked them to consider how available they were for them. And um, when we're talking about availability, I suppose it's important to put it in the context of shift workers, different family routines, self-employed people, uh, people who might work part-time. So what choices were available for people? And the result there in orange and yellow is limited choice. So people felt as though there could be more of a choice in terms of availability. Okay, and how do people like to access childcare? So what are they thinking in terms of childcare providers? Almost half prefer a crash setting of one sort or another. Now, obviously our experts are with us tonight and they might unpack that and that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a very normal thing here to go to a crash or there might be a cultural reason behind that. But that's where people are telling us that they would like crash facilities of some sort within their area. Okay, and I alluded to this at the beginning. Um, when we ask people to consider childcare options and we ask them to rank them in terms of the ones that are most important to them, we looked at things like parental leave, the qualifications of the staff, the standards of care, the cost, the flexibility and the location. And quality of care is everything, it's paramount, but location is more important than cost. So it's linked back into how we framed this issue in the beginning around a quality of life. So childcare is not just about um, somebody, you know, minding your child while you go, go to work. It's early years education and it's built into how we live our lives. Okay, and I'm going to move on now to look at some of the views from the service providers. When we're looking at staffing, the people who provided care for children said to us, oh, sorry, 
is that uh, their main concerns were around wage levels, recruitment and retention of staff. And that's a figure of 87%. So that's telling us something very, very clear. Next one then, again, how satisfied were you with the level of support for children with additional needs? And this is care providers. We'll see again in that kind of yellowy orange uh, color there, 31% dissatisfied. The light blue, very dissatisfied at 12%. So we do have a bit of work there, certainly in terms of policy initiatives. And then how would you rate the effectiveness of each of the following? So we're asking people who provide care uh, whether they think uh, the regulation is effective, the curriculum in Ashtar and Shilta, the National Child Care Scheme and the ECI scheme, are they effective? And their responses are as follows, just down here. Sorry, just trying to <laughs> work out my screen. So you can see that I couldn't. The regulatory mechanism, 61%, but the curriculum and the standards, 78% effective. And the ECI and the National Child Care Scheme, 73% effective. There's quite a positive response there in terms of the regulatory mechanisms and the standards and the schemes. Okay, so our final category that I was just looking at here in these slides is the early childhood educators. And let's see what they said to us. So when we asked them whether they were satisfied um, with the following in the sector, this is the level of support for children with additional needs, the opportunity to plan and improve programs, their own opportunity to upskill and develop, the quality of pre-entry training and the paying conditions. You see that they were quite satisfied with quality of pre-entry training of 58%, the opportunity to upskill and develop of 42%, but the paying conditions again is telling us something around the pro career progression. And as we all know, pay conditions, career progression, that's very much linked to the value that you perceive to be on your work. Um, even though you might think it's very valuable and certainly is very valuable, it's an important indicator of social and, not, and other value that's put on your work. Okay, so looking at the service providers again, what factors impacted in carrying out the job of caring for children? Documentation that must be maintained, that regulatory factor, and then the non-caring duties as well. So there's another theme emerging there around the one-to-one -one with the children and also the back office work. And finally, the final slide disposes in terms of the, the service providers. Uh, what are the following measures that would best promote the development of your profession? And we see up here at 96% greater financial recognition of qualifications and experience. So again, it's following the same theme through. So I'm going to stop sharing the slides now, um, and I'm just going to recap, I suppose, very briefly to you what we were talking about. Um, we got over 2,000 responses to the survey. We're looking at common themes around rural and urban Ireland. We heard from parents, from service providers, and from people who care for children. Uh, the quality and standard of care for children um, was the most important factor. And it came through in things like what parents want, uh, how service providers provide care. Affordability was a key issue, but flexibility, availability, and location were really important factors for parents. And we certainly saw a couple of themes emerging around additional focus on supports for children with additional needs, and also the type of um, steps that need to be taken in order to support and really progress the childcare sector as well. And there are issues around career progression, wages and salary. Uh, so that's it for me in terms of the survey. I'm very happy to take any questions, obviously, if you want to put them in the chat box. Thank you very much, Maria. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. And um, just as we I link into our next 
expert uh, in the policy kitchens, uh, Councillor Daniel Butler, I just want to add um, to all the things uh, that Deirdre just shared. Um, I was fortunate to uh, be an attendee of a policy kitchen and was blown away at the amount of um, uh, experts across the board um, of, all, of all areas under the care of the child sector and how the well-being, just finding solutions that benefit a family a school, a crash, where, wherever service providers are and communities. And, and she's right. Um, there was never, it was the most, it was the most refreshing conversation because it was never about um, one side of the country or the other. It was around finding solutions across, across the board. Um, our next uh, uh, panelist to outline the role of Policy Kitchens and the process overall is Councillor Daniel Butler. And just to give you a little uh, info into Daniel, he is a member also of our Policy Lab board, um, is so enriching and bringing great ideas to, to, the, to the board and, and what Finnegal can look at um, in future policy making. He's a Finnegal councillor for the Limerick City West area and has particular experience in facilitation uh, through his work in youth, drug and community services. So um, was certainly the key expert for us on the lab uh, around facilitation. So I'll pass to um, Daniel now. And just as he's unmuting himself, I just wanted to flag, I'm gonna drop in uh, the chat function an email because we have a number of requests about seeing the slides and we'll make sure you get either get them to you via uh, the policy email or contact uh, a local representative um, or PP member in Finnegal and we'll make sure that comes out to you. So I'll pass it over to you, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maria. Um, and thanks to you as well for the, for the presentation as well. It's always enlightening. There's always nuggets to, to be found in it and it's great to see the level of participation in it. But I suppose what Deirdre kind of outlined in her presentation and what that survey was about was kind of qualitative stuff. So looking at measurements that we can gain information of from, but I guess then the policy kitchen, I suppose it's supposed to be about more about the quantitative stuff. So it gives us an opportunity where everybody is actually the expert and everyone is treated on equal footing uh, in the context of the policy kitchens. So it's, it's really about your ideas, about your experiences and about your learning in relation to the care of the child, which is the particular subject that we, we've kicked off these policy labs on. And it's been a really exciting process. And I suppose as part of that, once we decided on care of the child was going to be first up, my role was to design a session that was that really gave you as participants as much opportunity as possible to bring forward your ideas, your experiences, and your learning. Because we really want to hear what you what you have to say. And really that's what policy kitchens are all about. They're about us listening. And if we're listening well. Uh, we'll find from those policy kitchens some great ideas and we have found some great idea ideas and innovation that's come forward from the policy kitchens and Nikki will probably touch a little bit more on that uh, when when she talks. So each session is facilitated and all we're there to do as facilitators is support you to be able to engage fully and to give you the opportunity to bring forward those ideas that you have and to hear them. Uh, we, our hope is that these sessions are, are innovative, they're designed to be so, they're designed to be engaging, uh, energetic and inclusive, to say like we're all experts on it, we all bring a very different perspective and with that each session is a very mixed group so you have people that are working in the industry, owners, managers and users and what's great about that is that when you bring the different perspectives together and we listen, we learn from each other and we also uh, gives us an opportunity to come forward with new ideas from that learning. Uh, and that's really the magic of good of good sessions of good policy kitchens is actually the group really takes ownership of it. It's about you as participants, not about us. Uh, and if they're if they're working well, and thankfully so far they have worked really well because we have some fantastic facilitators that have come on board to offer their expertise and their time, uh, and they have been working really well. We've really heard some amazing stuff, and that's been really exciting for us to to listen. And we're really excited about what that's going to translate to in terms of policy. Um, and I suppose if, if we want you to lead a session, what would we want you to feel? I suppose the most important thing we want you to feel is we want you to feel you, you feel heard. Uh, we want to feel that you feel valued and um, we want you to realize that this is leading to something. So for you, many of you have, would have participated in the survey. So as part of that, we're now here this evening to feed back to you. We didn't just take the information and run. We listened, we analyzed it and we're feeding it back to you again, just to see what you thought 
and see if there's any further contributions that you may have and you can throw into the Q&A this evening and we're really looking forward to reading down through what questions and comments and observations you have. And out of the policy kitchens as well, we'll also be compiling reports of the data and information and the innovative ideas that have come forward from the policy kitchens to formulate a policy. Um, so I, if, if you are interested in, in those sessions, uh, as we move forward in Policy Lab, I, I encourage you to get involved. And uh, I think if you get involved in those sessions, you will really enjoy them. They are capped at about an hour and a half of your time because uh, like many of you, uh, we're all busy, busy lives. Uh, I've just come from a six hour meeting that's still going ongoing apparently. I have two children outside that I think are, could be killing each other. Um, so we are understanding that you are very busy uh, and it is, it is tough to get involved in these sessions, but we really believe that if you do get involved, that you will enjoy them and it will be worthwhile. So we encourage you to get involved in this, which we think is a really a new and exciting way of developing policy and a new and exciting way of engaging with members of the public on, on things that matter to you and matter to your lives. So I hope that you stay involved and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Nikki as one of our facilitators, her experiences in the policy kitchens. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you very, very much. Um, as Daniel walked us through uh, just the experience and what um, the, the policy lab means to us on the uh, on the board, uh, as well as the party, I'm going to hand it over to some key people who um, can share their experiences. Uh, and our first up, as Daniel rightly pointed out, was our facilitator, Nikki Morley, and just give a little bit of background on who Nikki is. Um, she's a party yeah. member in the Longford Westmeath area. She is one of our volunteer facilitators for our policy kitchens. And I think um, this is something that you would have heard from uh, Richard, Deirdre and Daniel uh, is the fact that in, in engagement in all this has been at a volunteer capacity. So the likes that Nikki gifted her time to really find solutions and open up the floor and get great dialogue, uh, we're, we're truly indebted on the board. Um, uh, Nikki is a mum of two young children, eight and three, uh, and is very interested in this topic. She works full time uh, and has a very active interest in health and social policy. So we're going to hear from Nikki uh, on outlining her experiences as a facilitator before I pass it over to some some other participants. There you go, Nikki. Thanks very much, Maria. I suppose just first off to say that as a facilitator, um, you know, I facilitated two of the policy kitchens and as a facilitator, I was very supported by Terry and Maria and Colin and, and Tom on the nights of facilitating those kitchens. And it was a really great way, um, you know, as a member and as a grassroots member of the party to get in, involved in a very practical way in terms of contributing to this new approach to policy design and development. So from that perspective, um, it, it was a fantastic experience. What really struck me about facilitating those policy kitchens was really the high level of engagement from both parents and guardians of children and the providers in the discussions. You know, we had very open and honest dialogue around many of the, the challenges that we experience as parents and as providers of childcare, but also very much a, a solutions focused and a strengths based approach to try and really come up with innovative and creative um, ideas um, to really look and uh, you know expand on how we can provide care based on the four questions that we explored. So for anyone who is at the Policy Kitchens, you'll know that we explored issues around quality, around flexibility and accessibility, affordability, and then the providers of care. I suppose as a working mum um, of two small children, this is a very live issue for my family and having access to high quality, affordable childcare plays a central role in my being able to continue to work and obviously to provide for my family for their current and future needs. What really struck me about the, the policy kitchens was that, you know, sometimes when we speak about care of the child, we tend to focus on those very early years where, the, you know, the care is very much, um, you know, very high level. But, but caring for children goes right through primary school up to, you know, our children going into secondary school. And we really need to look at broadening, um, you know, our approach to childcare and care of the child through all those caring years. And that really came 
came up through the policy kitchens, um, you know, that care of the child is not just from not to three or not to four before children start primary school. And for parents, it's for about, you know, school holidays, what are our options um, and all of the other needs that we have as working parents. So just from a from a policy kitchen facilitation perspective, um, it was a very collaborative space. Um, even though there was diverse opinions and, and different experiences, everyone was very respectful of each other. It was great to hear, um, you know, from um, the key stakeholders in this area coming together and really having those open and honest dialogues um, and, and coming up with innovative ideas to really um, pursue and, and forward this area. So just want to say that if you are someone who wants to get involved in, in this area, um, I would definitely say it's a brilliant experience um, and it's a very supported space. And as I said, a practical space that you can contribute to um, the, the policy kitchen and the policy labs. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, I'm not a tech whiz, so I should probably have asked this question uh, before I kicked off, but we're going to hand over to Lauren Trainer, a young mum of one from Waterford um, next. And I'm hoping she can connect online. If not, you might. I think I'm here now, Maria. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and as I, as I, as you were connecting, just to remind everybody, a young mom of one from Waterford, and you were one of our participants in the policy lab. So we'd love to hear um, a brief overview of your experience on on the kitchen. Great, thanks a million. Um, yeah, look, hi, I'm a young, well, a young mom of I have a two year old uh, daughter. Um, she currently goes to a community uh, crash here in Waterford and she also goes to an unregistered childminder for part of the time. Um, like Nikki, it was and it's funny, we weren't actually in the same policy kitchen, but I would have to agree with her. One of the big learnings from my involvement was that I um, broadened my horizons and the perspective from childcare. So obviously um, under four years of age is my concern at the minute, but listening to the other parents and the providers on the call, it make me, made me have to think beyond this and that how childcare is something right up to the age of 12, 16. So um, certainly that's an area that needs to be explored. Um, from my participation, I certainly felt heard. It was a good small group not too big not too small um and it was just a really good um experience um it, it was nice to feel heard from Fine Gael, but also from the other parents and service providers and to realize that we all face similar uh, challenges no matter what part of the country we live in or our jobs or um even our earnings um so I was just asked to give a little bit of feedback about the National Child Care Scheme, which is a scheme that I currently avail of and my experience with that, which I fed into the policy kitchen. Um, the National Child Care Scheme, as most people will know, is a relatively new scheme um, for uh, the under threes. I think I stand corrected on that, but it's a brilliant scheme. But um, our feeling was that it's 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 not people aren't aware of it enough um not enough working parents out there know that there's this great subsidy from the government to help them towards their child care in the early years um however it's a quite difficult um scheme to navigate as a parent and i believe as a service provider so I work for um a public representative so I have a lot of experience in how to access schemes from all different types of social welfare, HSE, any grant council, I'm pretty good at it. I could not navigate the national childcare scheme and I deal with these schemes every single day. My experience from talking to friends, other parents, et cetera, where people either didn't know about the national, ch national childcare scheme, they were unable to use it, they tried to use it and they gave up. Um, and if they did get in, their experience using it was very difficult. It was worse than dealing with some of our, um, you know, like those call long calls you have to get um, to sort out technical difficulties. And um, so that was the one thing that came across there was that, you know, it's it's a great scheme, but it's just exceptionally difficult to use. And the solution, there's many solutions around that that were put forward in the kitchen that I'm sure I'll be fed into um, 
the policy. For my part, I've only been back at work um, for just a year now in June of this year. And we've had three reviews under the National Child Care Scheme where our subsidy has been reduced each time. Um, myself and my partner would be middle income earners, not in the high bracket at all. And when I w wasn't working or had less income in the year, I, when I only had six months of work done in a tax year, I got a higher subsidy than I do currently, which obviously is because I was earning less in that year. However, now I go out to work full time and I need the support of the scheme more. Um, had we have known this at the start of engaging with the scheme, my decision about working full time may have been different. So that's just a bit of an over um, an overview on my involvement in the policy kitchen and one of the issues that we discussed in our policy kitchen, which was the national childcare scheme. It was a fantastic experience. I'm really looking forward to working with the rest of the uh, policy lab to hopefully develop a policy on care for child. Great, thank you, Lauren, and thank you very, very much for sharing um, your your honest views and and the experience of it. Plus, highlighting the solutions and and your current circumstance. We're, we're really we're really grateful for that. Um, I'm going to pass over to. Denise McCormelia, and I'm 100% Denise making not a good job of your surname, so please correct me. She's uh, CEO of National Childhood Network, and I'm going to pass to her. Thanks, Maria. Um, yes, I was involved in one of the policy kitchens some weeks ago, and I found it to be uh, a really useful experience. Um, I, I suppose my, uh, my first few minutes with, within the... Uh, the discussion uh, terminology came up as an issue because it's a huge issue for those of us who work within the childcare sector. The organisation that I work for is funded by the DCE DIY and by the HSE and our role is basically to support the quality agenda within services. So for us, children are very much at the heart and the promotion of children's health and well-being, learning and development is, is absolutely vitally important. It starts with the care, but it goes way beyond that. Um, so I suppose the experience for me was particularly good because it gave me the opportunity to hear parents' opinions and parents' views. And for them, terminology doesn't make any difference. For us within the sector, there, we could debate and argue about it, you know, nonstop. And yet for parents who sought the services, it doesn't matter at all. What they want was, you know, again, I suppose that whole need with regard to um, the type of service. Uh, the learning for me is that it must be needs led because parents have different needs. So whether it's breakfast club in the morning, uh, whether it's being able to drop the child off very early in the day and leave that child there all day, or whether it's a case of drop off early in the morning, breakfast club, drop to school, collect and after school you know, the needs of parents have to be the driving force. And I really got the feeling from um, the discussions that, that um, Fine Gael really do want to let that be a driving factor, while at the same time being mindful, cognizant of the, the services that have developed, you know, the need to build on the strength of the services that, that are there. Uh, but but to be imaginary and visionary with regard to what the serve the future might hold for parents and how those needs might be met. And while we absolutely, you could hear very strongly the need for um, crash services as parents articulated them. And also that for me was interesting because my, my observation of my own family and my own children's need for services would be for crash services. But, but sometimes that actually is challenged uh, and you would have some that would be saying um, it's, you know, it's payment to parents to stay at home with their child for the first two years through all kinds of various schemes. But that wasn't what was coming through at the policy kitchen that I attended and I thought that was really interesting. Um, so I think beyond that then, um, I, I, I just think the solution the focus on achieving solutions was something that I thought was really heartening. I've worked in the sector for 41 years. It's been a long time. Um, and while there has been much progress, we still do not have what families in this country need. And I really, really would love if Fine Gael could, in listening to the variety of views, find solutions that would be of, of value to all parents in whatever 
needs they have, but that it would honor and respect and value those who provide services to a high quality degree, but that the equality of experience for children and families should be high quality. It should not depend on the intrinsic motivation of an individual provider or a community group within a particular area for the children and families experience good quality services. It must be a systematic approach for the future. And that is the one of, of a number of things that we I really would value Fine Gael doing in the future. And I hope that all of the future discussions that you have will inform this way forward. Thank you, Denise, and thank you for gifting your time. Um, like Lauren, just sharing um, your insights in the fact that cross-sectional approaches uh, need, 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 to be, uh, need to be met and needs need to be met. I'm going to hand it over to Kieran O'Hora, a social care worker from Cork. Thanks again, Denise. I'd rather stay from me but living in Cork. But <laughs> um, I just my I, I'm for, first of all a social care worker. I'm also a father and also a grandpa, a grandfather. Um, my main concern was uh, with the kitchen was uh, expressing the view coming from I suppose um, I suppose an underprivileged background. Like I'm a great believer in that education that um, children should go to, and I'm talking about the education system more than the care system, that children should go to the education, into the education system with equal opportunity as fine gear was saying, and that is, you know, an 11 playing pitch is possible. But um, you, kids going into school in the morning, you're dealing with the young children in school in the morning, and you take it for granted that their basic needs have been met, you know, and we work off um, Maslow's basic uh, food, warmth, you know, love, and all that kind of st stuff is met, but it's not. But it's not something that should be taken at home or anything else like that. Are going to school unequal in the morning, but they're going unequal because of the circumstances, the circumstances at home or whatever. And then someone there mentioned uh, the breakfast club in the morning. I think that's. A good start that would that's a good start a hot breakfast in the morning for people everybody and not just for the kids that turn and the mix other kids that are not singled out in, in the sense of that but i think also we need to look at their their, their their care their general care like i know in america in a lot of places they have um counselors in school they may have a nurse in the school for something that we should think of, we think should look at again. I think it's something that we should consider maybe implementing or see if we bring it in. Because it's, first of all, for the protection of the child, it's the first, it's usually the first point of contact with the child would pull up There's something going on, there's some assistance and help that's needed within the family. That the children will get their basic needs met going to, and allow to on a kind of equal footing. I'd Kieran, I, Kieran, you know, I don't I know. Like considering doing something like that, but from some different. Thank you very much, Kieran. I don't know if it's my side or if other people you're you're dropping in and out a little bit. Um, so what I'm going to do is hopefully we can come. We'll, we'll we'll try and come back into you in the Q and A portion. Um, and I, I think you said you're living in Cork, but you're from Mayo. Uh, and if that's correct, then I promise yes. you, as a Mayo woman, I'll definitely come back to you in the Q and A section. Um, but I'm, I'm yeah, just you lose a lot of votes if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you're, you're making me sweat here, sweat for me supper. But I'm going to pass it over to Karen, um, and I'm trying to pronounce her surna uh, surname Kunke. Uh, uh, hopefully, I pronounce that correctly. Uh, she's a founder and MD of Tigers Childcare in Dublin. And Kieran, hopefully, we can get your line sorted in between, and, and I'll come back into you for Q and A. We're running a little bit behind time. I promised all Policy Lab folks that I'll wrap just after nine, so I'm going to try and keep to that. So we'll go to Karen first. Um, and then I'll op I'll pass it back to Richard and then we'll open the floor to Q&As. No problem. Hi. Um, I suppose just to give a country to Clint's is, the fir is first. He says Karen Clint's. It's a very strange one. So no issue at all for getting it wrong. But 
look, I think the policy workshops are great. It's great to get this for it to be so, I suppose, with all stakeholders, including parents and families, and, you know, getting, even from my point of view, hearing, um, I suppose, the outcome of the survey is really insightful for me as a provider. I think, though, being in the industry for so long and working with government, uh, I suppose, in the development of the industry, there's kind of three main things I think that we need to keep focused on. The first one is not to lose all the good work that has been done. It's been huge development going on in childcare now for the last 10 years. And I suppose there's lots of things to be proud of in what we do. There's lots of things wrong, but there's lots of good going on as well, especially in relation to quality, professionalization of the market. And although our funding schemes are perfect, it's the first time we've had funding schemes that do give to all and give most to the most vulnerable. And that's really important. I think the second thing we have to get right is that piece about making sure that what we give for families and those most vulnerable families is really impacting them. And at the moment, it's probably not impacting enough to those most vulnerable families and the middle income families. And we find that they're still really struggling and they're struggling to get access to childcare and that's not just in settings like my own that's if they want to have child minders or you know if they decide to stay at home it needs to be very whatever methods we put in place need to be flexible enough that they do as Denise would have said said that they meet the needs of families and though that those needs being met lead to the children's best outcomes and then I think the third thing and probably one of the most important things is we have to look at a wage scale for employees and for our colleagues, because at the moment we are in probably the most critical staffing crisis we've ever had in the 18 years that I'm in business. And we have to keep those really educated people that we've now, you know, worked up into professionalization within that workforce. And the only way we're going to do that is, is where they know where they're going and they know what they're going to earn. And that wage scale has a huge impact on the quality of care. So whatever we do, we can't lose the quality. We can't pull it from anywhere. So we need more investment from government. Um, we need, you know, we're seeing how important and never has anything but COVID shown us how important childcare is to everything, children, families and the economy. And so we need further investment in order to make all of those things happen. But I think it's great to have these debates. It's great to see government in the background really really starting to focus on these issues and I think it's an exciting time um, and hopefully we'll have only good things coming out of it. Thank you Karen and thank you for for gifting us your time and um, and speaking about how to protect the care sector in terms of the the body of work that they all do. Um, I'm going to hand it over to um, uh, Richard next just to walk through next steps from from the policy lab side and then we will open the floor to Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm running as a poor MC, I'm running a little bit behind time so I just want to make sure um, we're using the Q&A function. I'll take some questions from the floor and then we have a number of leading experts to weigh in on on the various questions and hear from their insights and what they've thought of the policy uh, kitchen findings. So Richard I'll pass to you. Yeah, no, I think Karen very well summarizes it there. I mean, we it is the outcomes for children that matter. We have 300,000 children under the age of five, uh, and we have to retain quality staff in the sector if we're to deliver. Uh, I came from the enterprise sector, and, you know, there's 4,000 companies e exporting, and they have dozens of agencies supporting them in different aspects of their work. We have 4,000 uh, ch childcare providers, and they don't have access to the same sort of support uh, that that other enterprise, even though what they're doing is so more important. So what this is about is really much more than just consultation. What we're determined to do is to make sure that the ideas, the innovations, the challenges that came out of these workshops will now inform policy. So we'd be forming a team to take those innovations forward, uh, to kick the tires on them, see how can we make them feasible and workable policies that will make a difference on, on the ground while, as Karen says, valuing what has already been done. We're not doing this solely in the vacuum, and that's why it's been so important that we've had access to some experts in the field who have a long-term background, who can make sure that we don't you know, go off course, that we do value what's there, but that we are you know, challenging and, and forcing change where it's needed. Uh, so I'd just like to, to, to thank them for, for engaging with us. Um, you know, it is, 
the next piece will be the hard, the heavy lifting, I suppose, winnowing out from these ideas, things that can be done. Uh, and we will put a lot of time into that uh, and we will report back to you as we develop that. The people who will be on the team will include the people who've come to those uh, facilitated kitchens. So we'll be taking you know, people with particular insights, either as a parent or a provider or, or a worker in the sector, uh, to help us shape those things that will honestly reflect the challenges that have been unearthed here. Uh, and the board, which is an independent board, will stand, I suppose, as guarantor that this uh, is run in a way that has proper integrity for the people who've given their time to participate in, in these uh, kitchens and in the survey. So that, in a nutshell, are the next steps. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to um, the, the q and I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, well, first introduce uh, some of our experts that we have in reviewing and assessing um, the, the overall process and what they've heard so far. Um, first up, we have Professor Noreen Hayes, a visiting professor, School of Education at Trinity College Dublin. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, um, Noreen. Um, uh, we have Regina Bushell, and I hope I'm pronouncing your surname correctly, <laughs> um, founder and MD of Groveland's Child Care, which is based in Athlone, Mulligar and Tullamore. Uh, she is the chairperson of Chasseus, uh, which represents independent early learning and care providers in Ireland. Um, and we also have Marion Corey, our chairperson of, um, of the lab, among many things. Uh, she's the all-seeing eye for, for us um, and making sure that we are, uh, as Richard rightly pointed out, taking all ideas and forming the strongest policy we can have uh, and meeting needs that, that are being addressed tonight. Um, we also have Denise Cronin, another um, policy lab uh, colleague, um, on, on the line, and I believe uh, Senator Mayor Senior Kearney will, may or may not join. I know she's held up on the Senate floor. Um, but I wanted to read out some Q&As uh, and thoughts in the chat, and then I'll open the floor up to um, our experts. So uh, Jeremy Sheen uh, has shared early childhood education and care requires high quality universal access to services. We spend about uh, 0.5%. 37% uh, GDP on this at the moment, and this needs to be increased. Um, benefits arise from increased public spending, increased labor market participation, and better educated children. Uh, we must not forget to support parents who choose to stay at home. Absolutely, Dermot. Um, Eleanor McSherry had said, uh, bear with me, I'm going through some quotes here. Um, consistent, uh, Deirdre Ford, sorry, had shared consistent care, whether it's a uh, granny crash provider, it must be consistent, seeing the same face every day. Um, Maria Mahoney shared in the chat function, national child care scheme, some points, not all providers offer, offer NCS. Uh, there's no obligation to do it. It's available to all families for children under 15 years from working backgrounds. Massive disadvantages to disadvantaged and vulnerable children. They're entitled to nothing unlike other CCSP schemes where these children are provided variety, the words aren't coming out tonight. Um, and then I'm going to pop over to the Q&A function here to see some, um, some things that have come through. Um, I have Alice O'Donnell from Greystones, the shortcomings we care of the children with additional needs are disappointing considering the fairly recent addition of the AIM, so access and inclusion model scheme. Um, can we make sure that this is a priority to be addressed ASAP? Quality provision for children with additional needs make a huge difference to families and sets the tone for children's school experience. Also determines when and if a carer, usually mum, can return to work or education. And valid points there, Alice. I'm, I'm delighted to have read out your thoughts. Um, we have Natalie Ward sharing how long before a pay scale is generated and enforced for the sector. Um, Deirdre Ford had said childcare needs to be consistent. The child needs to see the same face every day. Minimize the number of faces they see if it's in a creche facility, family providers, two only max, so the child bonds with two other providers. Um, and there's many, many more. More, but uh, I want to make sure voices are being heard uh, and thoughts are being shared. But I'm going to pass it over to the experts. And I might come to you first, Professor uh, Hayes, to share your thoughts and insights. And then I'll, I'll pass to, to, um, or to Regina next. Am I on now? Thank you very much for uh, <laughs> inviting me uh, to, to be involved in this. And uh, it was uh, most interesting to read the responses from the various groups 
and to read the survey findings and to see the consistency um, across the uh, issues and the way they were being addressed. I would suppose um, the, the point made by Deirdre around the, the uh, quality location and cost being kind of very key and the emphasis at the beginning about the well-being of the child and their capabilities and, and uh, fostering their development. And they keep being raised as the most important issues. And yet when things get down to the wire at a policy level, they're actually not something that policy can dictate for, if you like. Um, and so if you work back from the well-being of children to the importance of quality in services to that well-being and to children's development, you move back then from what the research shows, which is that it's the quality of the professionals working with the children directly on the ground that matter most of all. And so that brings around then the issue of that was raised as most kind of critical by a lot of people, the wages, the general valuing that we, 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 we make for, for people working in the field. So it's a network of, of issues and I think it was very helpful to see them pulled out. The real challenge is going to be to knit them together into a cohesive policy that, that, that connects all the pieces together. One of the real challenges for Ireland has been the fragmented nature and the kind of reactive response that has been the policy history across the board full of good intentions. We, we actually invest very little directly into the, into the sector. Um, and I think we need to also think something, if I could pick up the issue of childcare. Uh, and I think it was, oh, do I have any Lauren who made, the, I think it was Lauren who made the point that um, uh, childcare is about more than early childhood education and care. It's also about school age childcare. But the challenge there is that the requirements in early childhood education and care are quite different to the requirements in school age childcare. Early childhood education and care is actually about the education and development of children in a caring environment. And care is educational and that education is care. It's a unique level of education and it has very particular needs and lots of research feeding into it. School age childcare is about rest, recreation, leisure and play, as well as the opportunity to, to relax out of school and to do some homework and so forth as well. But it is not a continuation of school. And so the focus is different. So that's something I think that policy, we need to tease that out a little bit because childcare is about that age range right up to when you feel you're, you're moving children into, into secondary schooling. So I think, I think a lot of what the findings show are what we might have expected. Um, it, I'm, I'm delighted to see the emphasis on the child. Um, it's been my experience though that keeping the child central is a hard thing to do when you start looking at the nuts and bolts of making uh, a policy and, and actually costing it and implementing it. And I suppose I'd, I'd leave you, I'm happy to answer questions, but I'd like to leave you with the observation that in order to have a good policy, you need to have a vision. And we don't actually have a national vision for childcare in Ireland at the moment. Um, we have a broad um, strategy document for um, services and supports for families, babies and young children amongst which is the reference to childcare, but we actually don't have uh, a vision which would guide a strategy which would really get policy um, knit together across departments. And that's the other challenge here, childcare crosses departments. And those of you involved in politics, it took me a long time to discover this. That's not an easy mix to get departments really sharing not only thoughts and vision, but budgets and commitments. And that's a challenge. So anyway, those are the thoughts that I had lots of, lots of ideas prompted and a, a lot of reading still to be done and unpacking to be done from the reports. Thank well you. Done.
Thank you very much, Noreen. Uh, we'll hear a brief word from Regina and then I've put out three names. One that I'll read out the question myself from Sean um, and uh, we'll go to you, Regina, first and then I'll open the floor to Q&A. Well, I, I would just say I would echo everything Noreen has just said there. I think those everything she said has just been so, so important to somebody who's been involved for, I think, over 40 years in, in uh, childcare and grew my uh, centres from working on my own to having six centres, um, it, ha it has been very challenging. And I have to say that la the last 10 years have been challenging. Um, at the moment, can I just sort of say that for most providers, I'd say all providers in this country, the, the, the child is at the centre of everything they do every single day. And that is so, so important. And there is so much discussion going on at the moment in so many places within so many departments are trying to pull everything together. As Noreen said, we have the first five there, which is a great strategy document, but we need to develop it and look at and having that vision. What is it we want for the children of this country for the future? And I would often have used the analogy of a three legged stool. We have paying, paying conditions for our staff, which is extremely important. We have quality and the paying conditions and the quality of our staff bring the quality to, to the table of what's happening in centres every day. We have state support or parental fees, one or the other. And if we want to increase paying, paying conditions, there's only um, two ways it can be done. Either the state actually invests more or our parents pay more. And we all know that parents are strapped at the moment and the National Child Care Scheme is there and we hear people saying that the, the middle income people are, are, are being really squeezed. We've looked at and talk about quality, accessibility, affordability, flexibility and sustainability of services. And all of those things are really, really important to, to um, pull together. We look at children and children with additional needs have been mentioned. And it's something that I have personally worked on for over a long number of years with government to try and improve the... <laughs> for all children uh, who have additional needs and we have better start there and things have definitely improved but there are more improvements required. We look at the providers who are absolutely stressed out at the moment due to staff shortages and due to um, the amount of administration that all of the schemes are that there are um, that they have to do for the schemes. The National Child Care Scheme was supposed to make that better it actually has made it worse. And we're hoping we, we, we will see that in, improve in, in the future. There are just, uh, our staff all want to see their, their uh, terms and conditions improved and it needs to improve. And they, we need to have a system of childcare in this country that is universal to all, a seriously universal to every child in the state. Um, our staff need to feel valued. And at this time, they, you know, there is a lot of talk of what can be done. We absolutely, in the next budget, need to see something happening there. It can't go on another year. Since the ECCE was introduced 10 years ago, we haven't been able to increase staff terms and conditions because really the whole thing has been capped for where it is, where it is at the moment. So where wages are concerned and everything else, the only way that can improve is by, by increased government funding. Then we talked about quality, Shield and Ash there, all of those things, which are, are really, really so important for our sector to see everything Im improve along, along the way. Um, I think everybody wants to see um, our, you know, our profession, what would I say, trusted, and we want to see respect. And the way we see that is they, the government actually putting, putting more in. The providers work so hard, our staff work so hard. Um, people talked about consistency in care um, all like our, our workforce has gotten has gotten younger and I would sort of say it's difficult to do that. A lot of them are, are at, at a what would I say childbearing age and with COVID and the, 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 there have been huge um, challenges there for providers with COVID, which will continue, I'm sure over over the next while. But for I'd say the majority of providers and for our staff, we want to see things improve. And um, I think it was Karen that said there, there is a lot of things that we could celebrate that have happened over, over the last number of years. There are so many good things happening. 
within our sector. But we need government support and we need a vision, as Noreen said, to see how we, how we move forward and to make and celebrate, I think, what we do every day and for that to be recognised. I think um, what, what we do every day and what we have done and what providers have contributed to this country over the last number of years needs to be celebrated and recognised. And the children of this country have just, you know, they, they're, having wonder, they're having a wonderful time each and every day in centres all around the country. And it doesn't get heard about, you know, that's not made visible enough, really. And we need to make it visible what providers and staff contribute to um, the well-being of the children in childcare each and every day. So I know that you have other people to go to, Maria, and I won't, I won't hold you up. But look, I am extremely passionate about where we're going in the future with this. I absolutely love my job. And I know the majority of providers around this country and the staff love their job every day because there are so many of them working in, in the sector. So um, for me, I'm really excited about this and I really wish you well with trying to get that vision, uh, that vision that Noreen was talking about. I think those of us who have been there for a long time sitting around tables really, really want to see this happen. So thank you for this initiative. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Regina. Thank you very, very much. Um, and delighted to hear from Noreen and yourself um, and the passion. Uh, while you say you have years of experience and, and we know you have, just to still hear the passion at the forefront is, um, is, is ensuring that this work that we're doing now in the policy, uh, policy lab um, will, will come to fruition. Um, I'm going to open the floor to um, a couple of questions that have come in to hear from uh, the voices that want to be heard. We've had a few people um, that I called out earlier just pull back because of internet connections. Um, so I'm going to go to Sonia Duggan and hopefully we'll be able to connect with Sonia. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? We can, Sonia. Thank you very Sorry. much. Not at all. Thank you very much. No, I totally agree and concur with everything that's been said this evening. And um, as an early years provider, you know, I too am passionate about what I do. Um, I think it's a great initiative which you're putting forward and please God, um, we will see, you know, it won't be all, um, hopefully it won't be talk. We will see action um, over the next coming years. And currently, as you know, we're only 0.2% of GDP. You know, we're at the bottom of the bottom of the line with regards to funding. And we would really like to see this um, expanded going forward for the sector. And most of all, you know, parents and the children and our staff are key and our staff are key to providing the quality that we require like we want a graduate-led workforce but we need more support in place to help you know help support and fund our graduates um, or you know graduates who've only maybe level seven and help them support them to get their masters and get their level eights and um, you know I just think that's the fundamental underpinning of quality that if we have that and hopefully good professional career progression with wages again to be supported by the department like all the parents from the you know the the policy group that I was on last week and therefore you know they want I suppose they want better availability they want more equality but they also want a la carte childcare, and that comes with a price and I think parents and the wider public they don't understand how low the funding in Ireland has been over the past 20 years and, you know, we have really evolved. We have really improved the sector, you know, in the last 10, 12 years with the supports that are in place, but we still have a long way to go. And unfortunately, as much as some people may like the National Childcare Scheme, we have the opposite. Like we just see so many children that are marginalized are not able to get access to the same level of funding that they would have been on under previous schemes but also parents that would have combined incomes of 60 grand they're only getting 50 cent off an hour which isn't worth the time my time or the effort in putting in that into my service because it's just the paperwork the compliance and um, you know checking the time you know the times in times out it's just absolutely ridiculous so for me to do that I would need to employ as a small service a full-time admin and I just can't afford it because we're you know most of us are jack of all trades within our services we're floaters, we're administrators, we're teachers, we're all over. But really, I would like to see better funding. Um, and it's, I suppose 
we need to see where is that going to come from and how are we going to support that and we don't need all the knocks i just feel the sector can be it is perceived as being very negative and greedy providers we are not we anybody i know we give 110 percent to our services we are constantly reinvesting we are constantly improving our staff's wages but we're still way down the benchmark so of the 0 0.2 percent gdp that's put into the early years remember some of that goes to those that are under six in junior and senior infants so how much of that actually is going to the sector when you take account of those employed by county child care committees pubble better start them the department look the list goes on but we really need to see just more financial support whatever way the best way maybe higher taxes i'm not sure just increased national child care supports for parents not 50 cent an hour it's an absolute insult and um going forward i'm happy to to work with the policy lab and any groups i'm associated with to really look for a better outcome um for our sector thank you thank you Sonia. thank you very very much and i was delighted um to see your see your name in the attendees list because i know uh, i i got to experience a, a policy kitchen with you and hear from um your view and your experience um, I want to pass the floor to, um, I have Damien Morris up next, um, if he's available. And as he's uh, just on, hopefully connecting his, uh, on, on connecting his mic. Yep. Hi guys, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thanks, Damien. Perfect. Uh, yeah, no, I guess I'm a parent. <laughs> I have two kids who both use uh, have been in a crash in, in Westmead here, a fantastic crash and it's well run. But um, as a parent, I see the staff turnover. Um, I can see why it's happening because of, I guess, wage levels. And I guess I'd like to see uh, supported by the state too, because parents are hard pressed for fees that um, early educators and people who get into that career have a pay scale similar to secondary teachers or primary teachers and that it's treated uh, as like a, an actual educator's job because it definitely is i see the confusion my own kids uh, when they come home and one teacher that they really like is gone and they refer to these people as their teachers because they they are teaching them and uh, they're responsible for our kids when we go out to work every day um so i'd like to see the state step in and, and really put a structure around that career based on your education your qualifications um, and then a career path for people who want to progress and do their masters um, and so on Thank you very much, Damien, and thank you. Delighted to hear it was flagged by uh, Councillor Butler to make sure we were hearing from parents too. Um, so you, you, you segued up really nicely for us there. Thank you. And if more parents want to get uh, their voices heard and get involved, just please again use the Q&A function or, or drop me a message and we'll make sure um, to, to get you included. I'm going to go to Gina uh, Menzies uh, next, if she's available to, to connect. And after Gina, we'll, we'll uh, connect with Mary Pluck. Uh, thank you, Maria, and thank you for all the inputs. Uh, there's quite a strong consistency, I think, coming through everybody's uh, comments. Um, it's just something I'd just like to add that it, it's a policy, and I think a few people have mentioned vision. So I think the vision should have definite elements in it, like access for all, Certainly there's a need for diversity and a huge need to recognize the professionalism and the need for professionalism in the standards that are provided. I suppose my other question was, um, it, a policy isn't going to be magic overnight. So therefore I think we should have a full policy, have a vision. It'll obviously have to be staged so that year one, year two, year three, hopefully. And the other thing I'm wondering, I presume those in the background um, that they would be looking at other countries. For example, New Zealand does seem to have a very, very good system where they've, it's very integrated between care and education. There's a huge emphasis on education and care. They don't separate them. Sometimes I think we, we tend to focus on somebody's looking after the children, but I think we need to sort of uh, heighten the, the standard of, of education so that there's a consistency in it. And I do think there's a need for diversity because not everybody wants to send uh, their child to crash and obviously people who don't uh, shouldn't be discriminated um, against so I just hope that we're looking at models that are in other countries as well to help formulate the policy and thank you very much again Maria for chairing it and for all those who've contributed. Not at all thank you 
And actually, to the point of international looks, I mean, I know uh, Nikki Morley, one of our facilitators, had, had popped in um, international examples of good practice from Australia is out of out of school hours care, access to uh, to before and after school care. It's an investment in our children, not just a cost. So I just want to acknowledge exactly. that point. I'm going to go to Mary Pluck next. Hi, um, thanks very much for having me. Um, it's just to reiterate um, a couple of points that Noreen Hayes and both and Regina made as well, um, that quality um, and the kind of well-being of the child all stems from the quality of the educators. Um, and again, to reiterate the point that investment in wages and retention of staff is pinnacle, but um, looking again towards kind of like um, a worldview model of how we can really learn from that global um, the global right like the way to do it and the way that's been successful again to like look at Australian models and New Zealand and their overall encapsulation of what and um, the framework for their early years but also a framework for the after school as well because I also feel that they kind of get left out and um, I know the guidelines were published in September last year and they've been a very welcome addition to support the quality of um, after school services and um, but are we going to get a framework for that to in to hone in on that that quality development and that quality care of those, those two and um, again looking at the Australian model and um, I've worked in Australia for a good number of years so I'm quite um, familiar with it and um, the professionalism of early educators um, and after school educators is far um, like more well, well, well known than it would be in Ireland. Um, and that comes down to having this really nice mentoring relationship after people have finished their qualifications so that there's people there to coach and guide and facilitate that quality beyond when they're just training so that they can really hone in on what quality um, education and care is so I think it's really something that we should be looking towards and not just having a, um, a, a pinnacle view of what Ireland does but having a worldwide view of it too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Mary and absolutely best practices and and how things operate worldwide is, is the best blueprint to, to really adopt and drive forward. I'm going to hand back over to a couple of our panelists one being um, I mentioned her briefly earlier uh, Denise Cronin um, who sits on the, the policy lab uh, as a colleague um, and just pass it over to you, Denise. Um, and then we'll go to Marion and then I'll open up the floor to three more questions uh, from, from attendees. Thank you um, very much for that. Um, Maria, and I, and it's great to hear all the inputs tonight, I suppose, uh, um, it, it, you know, is an area where it's a, it's a huge area, but obviously one that's very um, central to you know to the, to the future of the country, and it's, and it's great to hear from the providers. I think we you know we are listening. So my background myself, I'm I'm um, a member of Fine Gael, but but I have a particular interest in policy, and I think it's something I know that a lot of um a lot of members have had you know have various ideas on on policy, and it's great to have this 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 whole um forum to, to further that from, from people and to get the involvement from people from experts and as we can see people have an, you know, an awful lot of expertise in the whole area of the care of the child in the country and, and you know, to get get all that feedback and to bring it back into something that we expect and hope we'll have you know recommendations and we'll ultimately see implementation that will be for the better of the country and it's great to be involved um, I know from my own experience of being at a policy lab I was really, really, really taken with the inter with with particularly with with the child care providers and their interest in the development of the child because I suppose it's one thing that, um, it's one thing to be a child care provider but having to you know the, the the quality of your work is was so important to them and that came through and and their whole, um, their 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 whole focus on how we can improve quality and what we're hearing here and I, I think one of the big things that I'm listening to tonight as well is around you know, child care workers and the career path for them and, and the you know that that it is it, it, it does keep give people you know a, a living and that they're able to live on, on from a career in child care which is so important as I said to the future of our country so as I said we're, it's great to get the feedback great to have the involvement of all the people on the call tonight and thank you for your time and you know and this you know, we are very determined as a board that this will have, uh, you know, an output of recommendation and will, and will be implemented. And I know particularly, you know, with Richard and Marion to the fore as well, that that will, you know, that will happen, that it isn't, you know, we're, it, that it, it's not just a talking shop, that we are listening and that we want it to have, you know, practical impact and the practical benefit for people's lives. Because after all, that's what policy should do is support us all to live, to live the best lives that we can. So thank you everybody for your time tonight.
Thank you, Denise. Thank you very, very much. Marion, I'll pass to you. And I have unmuted myself for a change. Um, and Maria will tell you now the problem will be to make me mute again. Um, can I just say that, I, I, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming along and how much, from my point of view, this has been a real interest just to listen to everybody and to what they've said. And there are things that are jumping through my mind, you know, and I'm thinking, right, this, these are things we need to address. So out of what I've been listening to, I've been thinking about what Noreen said about a vision. And I, I, for the life of me, I cannot remember the guy's name, uh, an American philosopher who wrote an essay called On Bullshit. And there were three main planks in it. One was, he said, we need to set out what we believe in. Then we need to examine what we're doing. If there's a match between them, we're fine and otherwise it's bullshit. And that, to my mind, I think it sums up what Noreen is on about. We need to have a picture of the future. Uh, we, based on the things that we're learning from people, not from something we're plucking from the air. Um, it needs to be based on good evidence. And I support the notion of looking at good practice here and elsewhere. We need then, I think, to have a, a stepped approach which looks at what was suggested there, the, an incremental change, but also looking at segmenting it according to different needs at different ages. And then we need to consider something which we're, I think, particularly bad at here, which is how, how can we drive collaboration across various different areas of both policy and funding in order to see where we can go? Because one of the other adages from my past, as people who know me long ago would say, I'm only interested in figures because a budget is a strategy with numbers on it, right? Because there's no point in saying we're going to do something if we don't know where we're going to get the funding to do it. So I think all of those things are going to matter enormously to what we can or can't achieve. I was also very interested in the comment earlier on about what might be unintended consequences of some of our actions. Like, I think it would be a great disaster if a childcare policy in Ireland drove women to consider that they'd be better off not working, uh, based solely on the, on, on the criteria of the cost and the stress that it's bringing into their lives. So I think we need to think carefully about that. And I also know, think that we need increasingly to think that this is not just a matter of decision making for women, that there are many men who are choosing to take this role as well, and they need a lot of support. Uh, particularly when we're breaking down kind of cultural barriers about what perceived roles for males in society. For the people who work in childcare, and um, some of these now would be that I would know, I think they are enormously undervalued simply by the pay they get. I, I think the parents who interact with them, the people who employ them, they all value them. But it's worth nothing if at the end of the day, um, you're going home and you are like a woman at the moment I was talking to who, th who, who fears going on sick leave because her income threshold is so low already. Um, we shouldn't be treating people like that who are working in childcare because if we believe in the value of it, then we shouldn't be treating people like that. So all of that said, I mean, I do believe there are lots of things that we can do. And I think the most useful thing about this is that it's, it's a chance for us to get people involved in helping to shape policy because very often policy you know is framed without sufficient reference to the environment and the context in which it's occurring and we have long you know we have strategies and policies for physical infrastructure development we have financial uh, policy development and so on we have lots of areas but i can think as a country we're weak on the social infrastructure um, because it's taken for granted that it will be provided almost like a deficit model, um, that it'll arise when things are desperate enough. And to go back to Noreen Hayes, that isn't the vision, I think, of where we'd like to go for the future. And then if I can do my own version, Maria, of a party political broadcast, I would like lots and lots of people to get involved in the policy lab. Um, it confirmed for me our first efforts at it something I've long believed that people do actually want to engage in discussing important things that are important to them if they get a chance and if they feel it'll go somewhere. 
So I would like you to think about that. And just by way of giving you a heads up, the next two areas, once we have completed our work in this, but starting in parallel, we'll be going on to look at issues connected with mental health in Ireland, and we'll be going on to look at the circular economy. Now, they're very different areas, but these have risen up from, again, from us consulting with people in order to establish what people regard as priorities for them that would be addressed. And I think this is an important way for us to go about doing stuff. So can I thank you all? And I hope you'll all stay in touch with us. Thank you, Marion. You can tell why she is uh, our, our chair, um, the leader, the, the guru of all things of holding us together. I'm going to um, open up the floor to Lynette, Marie O'Mahony and Natalie Ward. But before I do, because it was a point that was um, Terry uh, Murphy, our, our policy guru uh, in Fine Gael had flagged 25% who took part uh, in uh, the survey in uh, uh, were, were men and it, it was an even balance who participated in the policy kitchen. So I think that's really important that there was balance there. Um, and just to flag from um, the Q&A chat, uh, Sean McKiernan had uh, posted in um, I chair my local community crash. We manage things prudently, both at board and staff level. Whilst we run a modest surplus, we need to build this up to have a fund for overall maintenance and emergencies. We would dearly love to pay our staff more, ultimately the living wage, but we need the funding to do this through Pubbel and national government. It's not something we have the resources to do. Mm -hmm. Pay in the sector is a major drag on morale, uh, retention, and even quality at recruitment stage. And, and, and it was a really key point um, that tied in many, many things that have al already been shared. So I'm going to open the floor and pass to Lynette. I would totally agree with that last point there on professional pay scales are, are definitely needed within this area. Um, many of our staff have, you know, huge qualifications. We have people working for us that have level seven, level eight degrees. We have people with masters working with us. But we have we have no leeway to pay these people any extra. As has been said before, the ECCE um, capitation hasn't been improved in a number of years. Um, the funding that we receive for, from government is based on a 38 week year. For AIM, it's 15 hours a week over a 38 week year. We, we can't attract staff to work for, for that um, period of time. We can't attract staff to a profession that only expects them to work for 38 weeks and then to, to go on to job seekers for the rest of the year. You know, we, we need our staff to be treated like the professional educators that they are. They need to be, to be paid in line with other educators, with primary school teachers, with secondary school teachers. They need to be able to see a progression for themselves. They need to be able to feel supported, to have maternity pay, to have sick leave. You know, for many of our staff out there, they can't afford to get a mortgage. They can't afford to live their lives. Many are living on the edge that mm -hmm. fear of something breaking down in their homes and not being able to afford to, to pay for it because they are literally living on the breadline. Many of the staff that we employ can't afford to use our own services. They can't afford to pay for childcare themselves. Many of our staff are forced to leave the profession because that you know if they have a child themselves they, it, they're, they're, there's no choice for them they, they either have to look after their child or stay in work and it's they're, they're going with their own child and who can blame them there, there needs to be serious change in the in the way that we look at the staff and the way that we look at the training that people have achieved and, and the progression for, for staff working within the sector. Uh, that, that, that's my, my biggest input in tonight. Uh, thank you, Lynette, and thank you for your, your honest insight and, and that's um, hearing from you and hopefully you'll, you'll stay involved in the steps of the, of, of the policy development because we need, we need to be working and hearing closely from, from your experiences. I would just flag and it was asked uh, and something I should have done at the start, so apologies. Um, we are fielding a number of questions and comments uh, for those who have registered and joined the webinar, so we're not um, able uh, to deal with uh, uh, 
uh, we're trying to get to questions from the live stream. So we're live stream on Facebook, Twitter, um, and YouTube. But I'd ask if you do want to make your comment heard and you're watching through those streams, please email, um, uh, I believe it's policylabs at finogale.ie, but I'll reconfirm that before we wrap up. Uh, so keep staying tuned. It's just, we can't come back to you uh, as quickly as you would like on that because we're fielding a number of questions and comments um, from those who have registered. I'm gonna pass over to Marie O'Mahony now. Thank you. Hi, thanks a million. I suppose um, I was involved as well in the policy labs, which were great. They were really informative. I suppose for my own background, I'm coming at this from two fronts. One, as a mom of two young kids under six, and secondly, as a service provider with three services in very different, um, I suppose, locations in terms of the financial status of parents. So I suppose as a mom, I find it extremely difficult to access childcare for my own children, where my services isn't in the town where we're living. So for a little one in preschool at the moment, it's just three hours, half eight to half 11, no option of staying on. And there's only one um, full daycare center in the town, which is full, um, obviously. Um, like there's 800 kids in the primary school where she'll be going into in September. Loads of sessional preschools, but nothing for the full-time mum. So I suppose, you know, that's a huge, um, I suppose a huge concern in a large, in a large town for me and absolutely no after schools care provided by anybody um, and again it's regulation maybe location where they are there isn't the availability you know of somewhere to to rent or to lease or to buy you know to offer um that service so i suppose that's one huge concern as a mum who's working and obviously my husband um, is working as well and then as a service provider obviously staffing has to be number one like the staff are you know are entitled to be paid a lot more than they are um and that obviously has to come down to funding, you know, again, from public, I suppose one of our services is an extremely disadvantaged area um, where in the past we would have had a lot of families availing of CCSP in particular, who, which obviously you now was gone. And those families are no longer entitled to term time childcare um, under NCS, which is massively disadvantaged. A lot of these children would be extremely vulnerable, extremely disadvantaged. Um, and in lots of cases, we've had to ask for you know, even tools for referrals so that they get sponsored hours, which isn't, you know, ideal for a family situation or obviously um, for ourselves. In the others, and it is exactly what a lot of the parents have said on, that the middle income are extremely squeezed. I would often question, you know, the National Child Care Scheme. Like, I don't know of any child, and I've asked this in some of our provider groups of children up to the age of 15, availing of the National Child Care Scheme. You know, really, it is once they leave primary school, so maybe if the age limit was lowered and the funding was increased, you know, for those within, I suppose, the realistic um, bracket of children who would use them. Um, also the aim, you know, really it's just reiterating, I suppose, what every other provider has said, you know, like the aim 15 hours a week, um, 38 weeks of the year, you know, and these, then these children who obviously need support and it has been proven that they need support under better start. Um, after three hours, suddenly don't need anything anymore for the rest of the day. That puts a huge burden on the staff in the room, the child itself, which obviously needs assistance, you know, um, and the other children, you know, which I suppose have to always be taken into account. But really, as a provider, it's literally to reiterate what everyone has said on the call um, tonight, but definitely the availability is a huge issue. Um, and we're very lucky we're in a community, we are a private service, but we're in a community building. So we kind of offer, operate with a community ethos, I suppose. Um, but definitely vulnerable children are totally left out of the national child care scheme now um whereas they would have before it's, it's a massive thing for our parents um and it was the one thing coming on tonight that i did ask parents what would they like and it was the one thing they said that they're totally out of it now whereas before i suppose they were the center of it and there was nothing for working class parents so i suppose we just need our for middle income parents we just need to find a balance if we could Thank you, Marie, and thank you for, for hosting your own policy kitchen and hearing from them, uh, because I think that's really important. That's what feeding into a more accurate and more beneficial um, care of the child uh, uh, sector that we're, we're trying to work uh, collectively about. Um, I wanted to flag, um, I will pass it over to Natalie, and then we will wrap up. I'm running about 10 minutes behind schedule, and I promised uh, the, the chair that I would keep it tight, but... Um, the Mayo, the Mayo blood in me ran wild. I will say though, um, and something that Councillor Butler had flagged um, 
uh, it is so important to note that the policy kitchens had a really broad discussion from what age children should start school uh, to how we use school buildings for children outside of school hours and much, much more. Um, and that comment is really uh, uh, valid and vital that, that I share. Uh, and it also links me into, before I pass to Natalie, um, as I said, we're going to wrap up at 9.15. Um, and if there's comments, questions, or anything you would like uh, to be heard or seen, please just pop into the chat or the Q&A function, and we will data collect all uh, and make sure that we're, we're connecting with you all. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure Richard recaps before we do disconnect on what next steps, because we really Really want to keep um, the 90 plus and I know there's a number uh, probably that double watching on live stream and also uh, so we want to try and keep you all involved and make sure we're building to, to better policy. I will pass to Natalie. Thank you. Thanks Maria. Um, so I work in the sector and have done for five years and like Lynette has said I would just like better recognition in the sector and just more pay for the job that we do. Like we get up every morning, we take children in from as early as half seven in the morning. We have them till half six in the evening. We look after them all day. We feed them their breakfast, their lunch, their dinner. We clean them up. We change their nappies. We educate them. We do all that. And some girls have degrees that they've taken four years to get and they get paid as little as 11.50 an hour for that job. And I just think that's a kick in the teeth for the work that we do. And primary school teachers get way more benefits. We don't get any maternity pay. We don't get any sick pay. Like Lynette had said, we have girls that have to sign on in the summer months when they're working only 38 weeks in the year. And I think for doing a degree or doing a master's, I just think we deserve way more recognition and better pay to reflect the job that we do every day. And I'd just like to see that happen and happen soon, hopefully. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you for sharing um, and, and making sure your, your point was heard and, and we'll make sure and feed that into um, uh, the next steps. Uh, before I pass it over to Richard to say final words, I just wanna say on behalf of myself, um, I have learned a great deal as um, a female living in rural Ireland, um, as a young representative, um, as someone who believes in the art of conversation and dialogue is what makes um, better societal change. And, um, and picking up from Marion's point on the focus we need on social infrastructure is phenomenally important. And that's uh, in essence what uh, I believe the policy lab um, has set out to do. And I hope each and every one of you, uh, be it registered on the webinar or watching uh, on live stream, uh, continue to stay involved. The email is policylab at finnegale.ie. Um, if you do want to stay in involved uh, and keep up to date with the this care of the child policy, but equally our future policies, um, uh, labs and kitchens that as they develop. So it's policylab at finnegale.ie. Um, I want to say thank you very much. Um, there's so many names, uh, and and uh, and and it's great to see that over. Uh, it, it, for most of this, we had um, close to 100 people uh, tuned in just on the registered webinar um, on a Monday night um, in an evening time, where I know many of you have uh, jobs to do and um, little little babies and kids to to feed and all those great stuff that go with it. So thank you for gifting us your time and really feeding into developing really strong connected policy change. And uh, I'll pass it over to Richard because I say things like that and Richard will be able to make sure um, everything is in line in really making sure everybody understands what the next steps are. But for me, I just wanna say thank you, stay involved, uh, policy lab at finnegale.ie. Um, and we look forward to hosting many uh, policy kitchens and webinars like this going forward. Richard, I'll pass to you for the final words. Yeah, no, thanks very much, Maria, and thanks everyone who participates. And um, I think everyone who has stepped on board this process has really become enthused by it. And there's a massive commitment to try and fix this issue and get us on the right pathway. Uh, the next steps, as I said, were we will form a team, which 
be substantially drawn from people who have come up through the policy kitchens, people who have the insight, who have a broad range of experience, who, who can help us uh, put real flesh and bones on the innovations that have come forward. But we're going to be guided on, th by this, on this rather by the policy experts who have agreed to support this process. Uh, so they will be there to kick the tires on what we're doing to make sure that anything we put in place is robust, that we have that broader framework, which both spoke about the, the vision, the capacity to reach across government, not just a, a sort of a, 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 a sort of a temporary fix, uh, which won't, won't do anything. We have to get this right. Mm -hmm. So just to thank everyone who's taken the time, I think we're all really enthusiastic and want to make this work and that the, the hard work is going to begin. And my father used to always say, uh, gratitude is a lively appreciation of favors to come. So in thanking people for uh, the effort you've put in to date, it is uh, hopefully in the knowledge that you will come on board on the next part, which will be the, the challenging part as we, 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 we design uh, tools that will help fix the challenges. So thanks very much. And thanks you particularly, Maria, for uh, carving out your time in Brussels when you're under such pressure. Thank you. Thank you again, Richard. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Go on.